I'm really pleased now to introduce um, Irit Felsen, who I think you all know. Has Come on, you guys can do better than that. <coughs> all right, if you, you'll scare away the cough if you clap hard enough. Um, anyway, uh, Irit is a clinical psychologist and works a lot with Holocaust survivors in second and third generation and has been for us a wonderful resource here at the museum. And, um, and now she's going to be speaking on third generation <laughs> inter intergenerational transmission three, through three generations. Uh, this is, I know this is going to be fascinating. And um, without further ado, Irit. Yes, thank you. Thank you very, very much. As you know, I am very, very fond of you personally. I know each and every one of you by now, and it's a very meaningful uh, connection for me. So we are, um, it's really, I have to say, it's really one of my uh, very special days in the year and a big honor to, to have this opportunity to see you and talk to you every year. It's been now several good years. With, uh, with this very special connection that I have with you and Liz and Paul. It's, uh, it's really a very special thing for me. Um, I wanted to tell you that because we are very small, it actually gives us <coughs> the privilege of making it perhaps a little uh, more conversational and, and I'll try to leave some room and time for us to talk. So I might skip some slides and go a little bit so that we have a little more of a flexibility around it. So <clears throat> I wanted to talk to you this time about the third generation and where do we stand with regards to what we know about them in terms of research. So first of all, you know, just to tell you, you know, the studies about the second generation started around the early 70s and by now about the second generation, and by now we have uh, several hundreds of very good quality studies. I'm not even counting the not such good quality studies about the second generation, covering the way that we, the second generation, went through life. It covers already, you know, some of us are already in their 70s, so it really covers our entire lifespan and how we handled a lot of life's transitions and challenges. Studies about the three, three G, as we call them, right? We are two G and the third generation is three G. Studies about the third generation began to appear only, you know, of course, much later. So we have a lot less of it. But by now we already have some very good studies from various places in the world. What we definitely can see based on uh, studies in Holocaust families is that trauma does not end with the survivor generation and not even with the children of survivors. It does have a very long reach down the generations. For example, I, uh, I uh, have a quote here from one of the studies from uh, as recent as 2019, and the researcher said, our review, they reviewed the studies on uh, families of Holocaust and say, our review also made clear that it is relevant not to limit future studies to offspring that experience warfare or was born during the war, but also focus on children born after the war, like myself, for example. Yes, I was born several good years after the end of the war. And uh, the, uh, as intergenerational consequences sometimes may only become evidence many years after the traumatic events. So it's not even only what you see in the survivors or in their children in the immediate years, but really uh, many, many years later. And indeed, following the studies that we have on children of survivors, um, the lessons from it were taken to other populations. Unfortunately, there have been many populations exposed to mass trauma since the Holocaust. And based on the same uh, ideas, because you know, by the way, I'm saying, I'll just say here uh, quickly, don't think that it was very easy for the professions of mental health, psychiatry, psychology, social work, to acknowledge that the Holocaust had terrible effects on the survivors themselves. It took a good 20 years for the professions to acknowledge 
that there were effects on the Holocaust, not to mention the second generation. There was not a trivial thing that, uh, that it was acknowledged that there are effects on the children of survivors, especially children born uh, way after the end of the Holocaust. But based on this knowledge that was gained on the basis of Holocaust uh, families, it was so uh, seen in many other trauma-exposed population, Bosnian families, Rwandan families, all kinds of families all over the world, Cambodian survivors of the Khmer Rouge. We have many studies now showing the same type of what has come to be defined as historical trauma, trauma that goes down the generations also in uh, descendants of the slaves, descendants of uh, American Indians, First Nations in Canada, same kind of processes. So <clears throat> what happened in the space between the second generation and the third? So in the beginning for the second generation was in a way our parents' uh, Holocaust, and the chronic and uncontrollable uh, awareness of the atrocities that happen in our parents' lives. If you ask second generation, since when do they know about the fact that their parents went through the Holocaust, basically we have known about it somehow from the time we remember ourselves. People don't say, oh, I learned about it at age eight or at age 13. We kind of have known about it uh, forever. And uh, there is a New Jersey-based um, author, his name is Thane Tannenbaum, who writes stories. He's second generation. And one of the titles of his story is called Secondhand Smoke. And what he says is essentially that the second generation grew up with the damaging effects of secondhand smoke when it comes to the effects of the Holocaust. We sort of inhaled uh, by living with survivor parents. We inhaled, we absorbed the uh, uh, certain after effects of the, of the trauma. The point of departure for the third generation is different. For the third generation, they have not lived from the time they grew up with survivor parents. They have not lived with their survivor grandparents in the same way that the children lived with their survivor parents. And the survivor parents are now, as grandparents, very different. They are in a different place in life. They are much further away from the trauma. They are grandparents now. They have the benefit of a lot. Someone said here, Toby, you said, with the, cho with the grandchildren, with the children, maybe I spoke too much. And that's the secondhand smoke, right? With the grandchildren, I'm more careful. That's the benefit of the years, the experience, the re reworking of the trauma, thinking about it. That's what the third generation experience in their families. They experience a certain protective distance from the trauma, a certain protective distance from the immediacy of the traumatic effects in the survivors. The survivors now can talk about it differently. They respond differently to triggers from their um, uh, uh, third generation than they did when they were five years, six years, 10 years away from their traumatization, raising their own children. So for, uh, as, a, as a rule, what we see, and I'll tell you a little bit more in detail, of course, but as a rule, what we see is something very different in the third generation. They are much more, uh, they are much less directly impacted by the trauma and they are much more interested in what happened. For them, the point of departure is the loss of knowledge, the loss of family narrative, the inability. We at least had fragments of both traumatizing, but also we had fragments of knowledge. We had fragments of what it was like to be, Susan, uh, you know, in your grandmother's uh, uh, estate or you know we have fragments that our parents threw about what it was like living before what it was like in the uh, Rinnek, you know in the middle of the town all of those things uh, they have very little relative to us 
and for them, while for us the issue was more the, the very upsetting immediate impact of seeing our parent very upset by something or seeing the parent shut down for a minute for something because they were think thinking about it, for them the most uh, painful aspect is the lack of knowledge, the lack of knowing where they come from, the lack of knowing their background, the absence of a family narrative, the absence of images that are related to where they come from, and the inability, therefore, to connect between all kinds of things that they are and that they uh, uh, experience and the link to the previous generations. Because as we know in general, you know, as I teach my students when I teach them couple and family therapy, we always want to look at three generations when we see a patient. We want to know what happened in three generations. We do a genogram, as we call it, right? As a, 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 um, a visible representation of, yeah, my mother was uh, Marta, my father was uh, Abraham, their parents were such and such, they had this many siblings, those survives, those this, and you know, we see what happened in the family, in every family, certainly where there are reasons to believe that there was trauma, it's very important to see, and as Bowen, who is a psychiatrist who is considered to be the father of family therapy, as he said, the past is in every step we take. The past is in the present. And even if we don't know how the past is in our present, it is communicated by very imperceptible ways in which people uh, interact with each other a lot of family themes are intergenerationally transmitted. So certainly in families of trauma, a lot is transmitted in various ways, both resiliencies and um, vulnerabilities and things that we are um, somehow sensitive to. And in the second generation, we have a much better ability to know why we respond this way, yes? Why is it that, I don't know, uh, it's very important for me to have certain staples in my house no matter what. I know that there is supermarkets and in the States they're open seven days and all the time. No, 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 I need to have certain things in my house always, right? Why, why, right? Uh, for the third generation, okay, this one is a very obvious one, right? But there are a lot of things like that that we absorbed in the family. For the third generation, it's much more difficult to establish the link to why am I like this? Why am I sensitive to this? Why am I, uh, uh, you know, where is my resilience coming from? How to put it even into words? Which is why it was so important for me for you to put it into words. What is your sense of the resiliency that you got generationally? Yes, because it's important to have it verbalized. If we have it very clear on our mind, it's easier for us to connect to it when we need a moment of self-prepping, and it's easier to tell the other, uh, you know, the third generation, you know, this is what I got. This is what helped me through my life. This is what I got from my grandparents. This is what I want to give you. This is how I see it. So the third generation has less of a direct re-traumatizing kind of feeling, but a, a sense of absence, a sense of lack of stuff that is very disturbing. And what they do, which is different from the second generation, they do a lot actively of searching for their past. They use all of the resources that are now available online. They access all kinds of um, uh, we, uh, online, um, you know, archives and, and all kinds of information that's uh, available. They do a lot of uh, the trips to the memorializing sites, you know, to the museums, to the towns where their parents were. And there is a lot of um, document, documentation of it already in various uh, documentaries, books, for example, um, I wanted to show you a, a bit of a, of a beautiful um, 
documentary that was created by uh, actually the friend of my niece in Israel. It's called Oi Mama. She called the documentary Oi Mama, and she interviewed her grandmother, and, and she talked about her experience as a third generation, and she also interviewed the second generation, her parents, yes? And you could see, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, but for example, a movie that was relatively successful a doc, uh, in, in the States, it wasn't a documentary, but it's based on a true story, was, um, what's it called, um, where he goes to the Ukraine, I'm blanking, Everything is illuminated, right? Where the grandchild goes back to the Ukraine and researches. So there are a lot of documentaries by now and a lot of interest that the third generation have. And now that some of them are already becoming parents uh, themselves, uh, they express both a fear of transmitting some of the traumatizing effects to their children, the fourth generation, but also a fear that the Holocaust will become irrelevant and how to maintain its, its significance and how to, uh, to uh, communicate that. This is a very interesting example of something that I wanted to show you uh, of a third generation artist about, uh, it's a, it's, she tr what she did was she listened very carefully to an old man, a survivor, describe in great details the living room of his parents' home in Berlin. Everything. She listened and listened and listened and listened to every detail, and she recreated the room based on what he told her. And then when you went to see this exhibit of the room that she recreated, you also heard the old man speaking and describing the difference between what she created and what he actually remembered. And what does it show you? It shows you the intense need of the third generation to see, to visualize what was it like, their interest in it, and yet the difference between the generations that even if you tell however much you tell, there is a certain difference between what we can imagine as the third generation. Uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, um, uh, I wanted to read to you a poem about the experience of the second generation, because instead of telling you too much about what we know in research, I can tell you that this poem very much captures a lot of what we see in uh, research about the experience of the second generation. So it goes like this. Okay, I will read it from here. You were mute to free our spirits. You kept secrets to spare us grief. Yet we were tethered to your pain and mourned for your losses. How could you know your eyes spoke volumes and your silence painted pictures? In perfect step we moved, not too close, not too much, not so soon, please don't push. If you think we didn't care, we thought you didn't either. If you thought we didn't need your burdens, we thought we wouldn't bother you with ours. You thought, we thought, you're assumed, and so did we. All to keep us safe, all to keep you unhurt. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. So this really captures a lot of what we see in research about what we call the double wall of silence between the generations. Parents didn't want to burden their children uh, and wanted the children to be free of these traumas. Uh, children didn't want to ask the parents because they didn't want the parents, they thought it would hurt the parents to talk about it. And so there was this wall of mutual protection which really what we see now actually in research is that um, the silence, the nonverbal presence of trauma is much more damaging than verbal uh, uh, appropriate communication about it. So um, yeah, 
So some of the things that we, uh, I'll just very quickly because uh, I'm, I'm till 12.30, right? Okay, so very quickly just to uh, whisk through some of the main things in the second generation before we go to the third is to remind you that when we look at, when we ask um, non-clinical, you know, highly adaptive samples of second generation about their memories uh, of childhood, what was it like in their relationship with their parents. What we see is something that my friend Hadass Weissman from Haifa called failed intersubjectivity, meaning exactly that which is like in the poem, yes? Parents who are very uh, protective, very intent on fulfilling the children's needs and all of that, but a certain uh, inability to communicate openly with the survivor parents because of that double wall of silence, a sense that the parents were not really available to see the child for the person and the individual that they were because they were so busy protecting themselves from the pain, protecting the child from the pain, working so hard, and all of those other things. So people feel that their parents were emotionally not available to them and that they couldn't understand their parents very well and the parents couldn't understand them very well and didn't really, and that it was very difficult to talk openly about negotiating conflicting needs. Like if the child wanted to go to a school far away and the parent didn't go, want the child to go to college far away. If the child wanted to study this profession and the parent thought it was not good and that it was very difficult to negotiate and openly come to uh, 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 a better solution that would satisfy most of everybody's needs. Uh, as adolescents, we, as the second generation, had much more difficulties leaving home and, and sort of establishing ourselves as individuals, make decisions that our parents didn't like. Many people tell me I married the person that my parents wanted or I didn't marry the, parent I, the person I wanted because my parents would have, uh, you know, uh, set shiva on me or would have been uh, heartbroken or things like that in adulthood. As I think I mentioned to you once, what I see a lot in daughters of survivors is uh, what I call a compromise solution. Uh, daughters of survivors explain often, uh, or they don't explain, they describe that they married someone with whom they already had an ambivalent relationship. Not a, like a all sort of, ah, I'm in love with this man, he's wonderful, I'm marrying him, but someone with whom they already had a somewhat difficult ambivalent relationship and I think that that was explained very beautifully by one, not one, I've, I've heard it from more than one patient who actually said to me, said to me, I thought, okay, my parents want me to get married, I have to bring them naches, I have to get married, I have to have grandchildren, this is what they want. On the other hand, I don't want to leave them. I want to take care of them. I, they're my parents, my survivor parents. So what am I going to do? I'm going to marry. I'm going to have children. Then I'm going to divorce and come back and take care of them. Yeah, which is a compromise solution between two very conflicting needs. So to marry someone that you're not wholeheartedly in love with is a good solution because then you're not... Uh, um, disloyal to your parents. You're not loving this stranger all of a sudden who did nothing for you as much as you love your parents who did everything for you, right? So it's a kind of a thing. Okay. And indeed, we also see the children of survivors, in particular daughters, have lived their lives, their adult lives, much more intertwined with their parents often and sometimes to the detriment of their relationship with husbands and even with their own children because the parents came first. Um, and in, the, in North America, in the United States and Canada, we see some signs in, when we measure it that both the second generation and the third generation show a little bit less of what we consider psychological differentiation. What is psychological self-differentiation? It's the capacity to feel very clear, to be very clear about what I feel, what I think, what I am, even when it's different from what the people that I love feel or think, and yet remain in close connection with them. 
because people who have a very hard time differentiating themselves and allowing themselves to think or be or do things that are very different from their parent have two choices. They either remain very tethered to their parents and do exactly what the parents want, and that sometimes is not so great because it means they, they haven't really taken care of their own needs in many ways and discovered who they are, or there are cutoffs. The, the kid who goes to live on the other side of the, of the continent or even the kid who lives, you know, in New Jersey when it's not far from Brooklyn or from Borough Park or from wherever, but they barely see the parent. And if they come, they come only with the husband, with the kids, with the dog, with the cat, with everybody else so that there's a lot of buffer, not too much closeness. So that's what we see um, uh, with the second generation. And we see a little bit of it also in some studies between the third generation and the second generation. A little bit of it too. So, um, and what we said, and I, I will not say too much about that, but one of the most important mechanisms which we see in all trauma-exposed populations, in all trauma-exposed families, the mechanism by which a lot of the transmission occurs from one generation to the other is what we call role reversal or parentification of children. And that means that um, when the parents suffered very much, the children obviously and naturally are aware of that and they don't want to cause their parents any more grief. And so they try to avoid doing it and that puts a certain pressure on the children they can't behave like normal adolescents or normal, you know, whatever, because how can you do that to parents who have been through the Holocaust, right? Or parents who have been uh, in Vietnam uh, in the war, or parents who have been persecuted and tortured by the Khmer Rouge, right? You have to be careful. And a very beautiful way, simple and beautiful way that was, it was put was actually by this uh, researcher who worked with Cambodian families, and he said, parents who continue to be psychologically affected by past trauma, such as trauma stemming from genocide, may communicate, even if indirectly, their emotional vulnerability to their children and thereby instill inordinate concern in the children for the parents' welfare. And that's exactly what it was. So we will go a little bit uh, further, and I will say that children, however, have what we see in all families, not just in Holocaust families, children have different susceptibility to everything, to issues and problems in the family, to the situation around the family, and also to strengths and resiliencies in the family. So if you talk to people who come from the same family, you will often hear them uh, speak of their parents and think they each have completely different parents, right? This child will have taken from the parents their strength, their resiliency, their positive uh, attitude, this and that. This child will say, my parents were a little bit depressed, my parents were a little bit this, my parents were this, and you're like, this is the same family, right? Now, it's true that first of all, the situation in the family is different from each, for each child. It's also true that parents treat children differently, whether they mean to or not. We all are human and we treat children differently. We treat boys differently than girls. So oftentimes in families uh, of Holocaust in particular, but also in other families, oftentimes boys are the recipients of parental messages about strength and resilience and go get and do, and girls are the recipient of messages about stay close, take care of me, it's very important that you stay nearby, I need you, uh, uh, don't leave me, things like that. Yes, so of course you have a daughter and a son in the same family, they have a very different experience of their parents, 
Not to mention that we are also, all of us who had children know, the children have different personalities and they have different vulnerabilities or needs. So one child from the beginning is much more, needs more space and autonomy. And that's fine with them if the parent is a little bit uh, busy or uh, laissez-faire kind of, they don't see it as neglect or le they're like, this is just fine. A child who needs a lot of relatedness might feel that they need more from this parent, that this parent was cold, was not available, things like that. Also the opposite. A child who's very related and needs more closeness will not mind a parent who's a little bit more intrusive. The child who needs autonomy will mind it at all, um, will mind it very much and will feel my parents was intrusive, my parent was too much in my face, they needed too much from me, I couldn't get away from them. So people are different and the outcome is different. And one thing that you know, and I won't stop on it too long today, it's a very, very interesting topic, which I wrote a paper about more than one, uh, and that is the effects of trauma in the family, the way I see it, on the sibling relationship itself. And the fact that I see in Holocaust families a problem, which I don't see in other families, even though other families have a lot of issues. They can have even incest and whatnot, but I don't see as much cutoffs between siblings, where the siblings don't want to have anything to do with each other. And I can tell you that many times I've heard the Holocaust survivors telling me m the biggest tragedy of my life is that my children don't speak to each other, not the Holocaust. I, I, I somehow already got over that, but that in my new family, my children don't speak to each other, that's my tragedy, yes? I think that it's not coincidental. I think that it has something specifically to do with the presence of trauma in the family and the way that each child feels the burden of trying to protect the parent from pain and from all kinds of bad things. But because they are very different, each of them accuses the other person for causing the parent pain. So how about, for example, the daughter who stays very close by and takes good care of her parents and goes with them to the doctor every time and didn't go to the college far away and didn't make a career for herself and whatnot and is taking care, she's also the one who takes the burden of all of the Michigas, you know, the daily Michigas. And, uh, and she has a lot more, you know, sometimes um, friction with the parents. She also sometimes is the one that shares more of her own problems with the parents because she's in daily contact with them, right? Or she sometimes needs uh, financial support from them because she didn't develop her own career in order to be more available and all of that. The other child, mostly uh, often a son, but sometimes if there's only two daughters, then maybe a daughter, that one got emancipated, left, made a career, made their own life, uh, is very successful, never shares their problems with the parent, never tells them what's wrong in their life. I mean, I think I mentioned to you in the past, I have cases where a son of survivors didn't, or a daughter like that, the emancipated one, didn't tell the parent that they had a heart attack, didn't tell the parent that they're going through cancer, didn't tell the parent big things, yes? because they're protecting the parent in this way. So what happens? This one that doesn't tell the parent about their bankruptcy, about the cancer, about the heart attack, this one says the daughter who's there, who's telling them every, every problem she has, she's killing them. She's driving them into an early grave with, because she's sharing all of that. This one who's near the parent is the one who hears from the parents about the brother or the sister they barely come to visit. They, when they come, they come for three days, they stay in a hotel, they barely come, they, they, they don't really care enough about the parent in her opinion, and she gets to hear the parent's pain about that. So she or he feels that this one got away and doesn't care enough and abandoned the parent emotionally and abandoned their sibling emotionally, this one 
sees this, the one that emancipated sees this one as killing the parent. So everybody is killing the parent. And because the, the intensity of what it means to cause survivor parents pain, the intensity is so serious because of the presence of the trauma in the past and what the parents went through, it creates very intense resentments and mutual criticism between the siblings. Now, why am I talking to you about this in the context of a talk about the third generation? Because what we see in the second generation in studies is that one of the things that were most painful for the second generation growing up was the lack of an extended family. The absence of uncles, cousins, that there was nobody like that. Yes, we all had, if we were lucky, we had substitute extended families. We had, we had Uncle Yasha and, and Aunt Laura and that weren't related to us, but our parents created these substitute families, but they were not our family. And that was a very painful thing for many of the second generation as we see in studies. Now, the third generation, if the siblings have a very bad relationship, the children of survivors, they don't have an extended family. And again, there was a family that was created, and the, the, the third generation again loses the extended family. And that, to me, is a very tragic uh, reenactment, which is directly one of the effects of extreme genocidal trauma in trauma-exposed populations. It is not a coincidence. So uh, what I say often when I can, when I speak to, third gener to second generation, third generation, I say, whatever your relationship with your sibling is, try to make it possible for the children to have a relationship, because that's a new generation and they need to have an extended family. We know what it was like growing up without it, and we want them to have the benefit of an extended family. So try to somehow, even if you can't stand being in the same room with your own sibling, make it possible for the third generation, encourage them to get together with their cousins, do things together, and don't poison the third generation's relationship with each other. So uh, that's what I wanted to say about that. And um, uh, what I wanted to tell you a little bit more specific about the uh, third generation, because I have 10 minutes for that, about. So first of all, one of the first observations about the third generation was quite worrisome. It was shown that they represent a lot more, a much bigger percent on a psychiatric unit than their percent in the general population, which raised the possibility that they have more problems than the general populations. Uh, we also see in some studies that uh, when you ask parents to describe their children, second generation, uh, third generation, and other children who are not third generation, the uh, parents of the third generation, their ratings of their children suggest higher levels of fear, of neurotic behavior, of aggression, of social withdrawal, and inhibition. Um, there is also some indication of a higher prevalence of eating disorders in the third generation. And as I said before, some indication of less good differentiation of self so the third generation are a little bit less able to differentiate from their parents uh, relative to their peers. And that is a finding, for example, in Israel in a study that looked at a whole cohort of people who went into military ba basic training, when their peers were supposed to rate each other, turned out that the rating of the peers of the third generation showed that the peers perceived third generation as functioning less well during basic training than they were rated by others. So there is some uh, issue there. What we see is that there is a dilution of the transmission of effects related to the Holocaust 
from the first generation of survivors to the second to the third. First of all, there is a dilution anyway. So the first generation has more higher ratings of anxiety, depressive tendencies, all kinds of issues, um, a much more, um, much grimmer perception of the world. You know, if we look at the world views, as we call it, uh, is the world a benevolent place, a place where, you know, a kind place? Well, survivors obviously don't think that the world is such a benevolent place. And survivors also don't think that the world is a very just place, right? I mean, how can one uh, think differently? So the same, the children of survivors also have higher ratings in all of these things relative to our peers who are not Holocaust survivors. We are not as high as the survivors. We're not as anxious. We're not as uh, 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 like that. But we have more than our peers. And the third generation, interestingly, you would think that they would have uh, let me start. First, I will say there is an indication of dilution. So first of all, there is dilution from the first generation to the second. And also, there is dilution depending on how many of the grandparents, how many of the parents were survivors. So if I'm a child of two survivors, my chance of having higher anxiety, higher depressive ratings is higher than um, or Rina's children who had one non-survivor parent, right? So there's also a dilution in this way. There is also the same kind of dilution for the third generation. If the third generation has two parents who are children of survivors, they have higher ratings of anxiety, depression, all of that, than other people. But if there is only one parent who's second generation, especially if the one parent is a mother who is not a child of survivor, then they look the same as everybody else. Because the mother is the most powerful, uh, when we look at, when we compare, is the father survivor, is the mother survivor. When the mother is the survivor and when the mother is the daughter of survivors, the transmission is stronger than when it's a father. Yeah. So all of this is true, and you would expect that the third generation will therefore have also, as a rule, less anxiety, less depression than the second generation, right? Just like the second generation had, had less from, well, there is some indication that unfortunately that is not the case. That the difference between the second generation and our peers is smaller than the difference between the third generation and their peers. So that somehow the anxiety, the depression, all of those things are actually higher in the third generation than in their peers. So one could say, well, look at the world that they're living in, right? But no, it's still higher when you compare them to their own peers. So something is happening that is making the third generation more anxious, more vulnerable to the issues that are going on in the world right now than their peers. They have a higher vulnerability, a higher sensitivity, probably based on what they know happened to their own families, right? So when anti-Semitism is rising in New York right now, it's different for my children than for somebody who has no connection to the Holocaust, obviously, right? Because they know that it's a real possibility that things happen, right? Okay, so the other thing that I wanted to tell you is about um, the relationship with, um, with the grandparents. And um, so, I, as I said, I wanted to show you some bits of Oi Mama, but I won't. But it's a beautiful depiction of what we see also in research, which is that the perspective of the sec third generation about the Holocaust and about their grandparents is very different from their parents, from the second generation. The second generation, when you look at 
what I see in my private practice, what studies show, what the literature and the documentaries created by the second generation show, the second generation had a much more complicated relationship with their parents. They loved them, they cared for them, but there were also uh, a lot of difficulties in that relationship. Just like you, Susan, so honestly said about your, um, your own parents, uh, you know, a lot of you, by the way, child survivors who survived with their parents share some characteristics with the second generation because you had survivor parents and you also had to worry about your survivor parents and what they've been through and how you can allow yourself to do this or that. And you were also parentified children often because your parents, as um, Gabriela said, were immigrants, they didn't speak the language well. You were American or you were Israeli. You had to do a lot of things that normally children at the age of nine or 10 or 11 don't do. So you share a lot of uh, characteristics with the second generation. And as you so honestly said, these survivor parents were formidable in many, many ways, but they were also often not the easiest people to grow up with. And so the relationship of the second generation with their parents was complex. The relationship of the third generation with their grandparents, the survivor, is very different. You have to take into account that the third generation grows up in a very different society. The general attitudes and views about the Holocaust and about Holocaust survivors change dramatically in Israel and in the world after the 60s. Specifically, we look at the Eichmann trial as a very big changing point where people became aware of what happened and all of these very difficult, difficult attitudes that were expressed in the early years in Israel and in other places here too. Uh, about the Holocaust survivors, you know, what did they do to survive? How come this one survived when everybody else died? What did they do? What did they have to do? Uh, why did they go like uh, sheep to the slaughter? Um, you know, all kinds of derogatory attitudes that changed, and the third gen, so the second generation grew up still with some of that, and wanted to distance themselves from it, and didn't feel that it was a very prideful thing to be a child of survivors. But the third generation grows up in a very different world where survivors are much better understood, much more appreciated for their resilience. There's much more research about their resilience. There's much more social, in the social discourse, there is much more emphasis about it. You are revered you are revered as speakers in the schools, in public spaces. So the third generation has a very different attitude to their grandparents, the survivors, and we see a much more uh, warm relationship, a lot of pride in their survivor grandparents, a lot of appreciation to who you were and what you managed to do and how you managed to live your lives, and a much, much warmer relationship and um, and I think that is um, a beautiful thing to be able to share with you that this is really what studies show us this is really what is happening um, and what I wanted to do with you if we have time was uh, I wanted to share with you a tiny little thing you know I don't know how many of you have heard about something called let me just see that I um, Oh, yeah, so I just wanted to tell you also that as part of the interest of the third generation and their appreciation, they are the ones who actually break often the double wall of silence in the family. They come to the grandparents and ask about the Holocaust. They are less worried about hurting the grandparents. They are much more uh, comfortable asking and they want to hear, and the grandparents, again, as I said before, are at a different time in life and are ready to share and to talk to the third generation. So the wall of silence 
is often broken many times in Israel. Definitely, it's often triggered by school projects. Go home and ask your grandparents about their families and all of that. So what I wanted to tell you is that um, one of the ways that we work with trauma, and that is actually one of the methods that the World Health Organization and the Medical Association and the Psychiatric Association and all of that recommend as one of, a, of the effective ways of working with people, especially on trauma, is called EMDR, I Movement Desensitization Reprocessing. And it sounds, and it, uh, some of you may have heard about it. It sounds like hocus pocus because really what happens is we ask people in very guided ways to think about, let's say, a traumatic uh, thing that, they, that bothers them. And then we ask them to follow the fingers of the um, therapist without moving their head, just with the eyes. So you, what you would see if I were the patient and I would be following the, the hands of the therapist, my, my head is not moving and I would just be doing this. And sometimes it's not the hand, sometimes some people don't have enough strength in their arm to go like this all the time. So there is uh, lights that go from side to side. Some people use um, tapping on the patient's uh, knees, and some people hold um, little buzzers that go bzz, 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 bzz. The point is that EMDR relies on what we call bilateral stimulation. So stimulation of the two hemispheres, <coughs> one uh, like back and forth, back and forth. The left hemisphere has different specializations than the right hemisphere. And the idea of reprocessing is that when we do it in a safe place with the therapist, when we think about a traumatic event in a guided way, and we at the same time stimulate the two hemispheres back and forth, then the right hemisphere, which holds mostly emotionally loaded uh, experiences in a very vivid way, it holds them just like the, let's say the hand would hold a splinter. If you got a splinter into your hand that didn't go out, right? It's a trauma and it sits there. What does the hand do? The hand sort of covers it gradually, right? And it's closed in there. And if something pushes on that place, then it's very painful, right? But you gradually learn to hold everything, you know, hold it just so that it doesn't touch upon it. And that's how we adapt to trauma, physical trauma, right? A traumatic event is stored in the right hemisphere in a similar way, very vivid, like it was. The same feeling, the same smells, the same sights, the same, it's vivid. It doesn't get to be reprocessed into a memory of something that happened in the past. This is why, for example, in uh, I remember Ruth um, Ruth uh, Pugarski saying, uh, "You remember?" She said, "I feel the stones on my back when she lay there in the in the, the um, ditch." And, and stones were uh, over her. Said, I can feel the stones on my back until today. That's a very vivid uh, memory. Whereas if I ask you about something that is not so traumatic, we have a feeling when we talk about a past memory that it's a past memory. This feels vivid as if it's still happening. And the idea of EMDR is that by processing it bilaterally, it helps the brain use all of the other parts and make the connections from the left hemisphere and from other places that allow the memory to become less vivid and rescind, to rescind into the past. So, recede, sorry, recede into the past. Thank you. The D desensitization. <coughs> and 
EI movement desensitization reprocessing. Uh, it's a very helpful method for many people. Like everything else, it doesn't help everybody. Not everybody. But many people get unbelievably uh, good results at, in a relatively short time. So if there is something that really bothers you, I would uh, recommend that you look for an EMDR specialist and say, why don't we work for five, six sessions, that's all, and see what it does for you. Now, in EMDR, one of the first things that we do is what we call install resources, which means for our brain, when we think about something that's very strengthening, something that's very good for us, that makes us feel in the best way about ourselves, if we think about it very um, intently, and we try, let's say that my, uh, it can be, it can be a, a, a something about myself, like a moment or a quality that when I feel myself like that, I feel at my best. I feel that this, if I just hold on to that feeling, that's something that's very strengthening for me, yes? Or it can be somebody that was very helpful to me. And if I think about that situation, when that person was like this, or my parent at some situation that really holds their very most supportive and helpful features, or it can be a place. Uh, if I imagine this place, let's say, maybe for Susan, it's her grandmother's house and how she felt there at the time. Or something like, I don't know, sitting by the beach and watching the, the, the waves. But what happens is, if we think about it very intently and really make ourselves think about what did it look like? What did I see around me? What were the sounds? What were the noises? What were the smells? The smell of the breeze or the smell of the canning of the fruit or whatever it is that I'm thinking about, to think about it very in great detail, the more neural circuits we evoke by thinking about it, the neural circuit of the smell and the sight and this and this and this, the more neural circuits we evoke as we think about it, the more powerful that resource becomes in our mind. And then it's used as a resource in EMDR, and also you can use it in regular life. When you don't feel good, when you need to give yourself a boost, you go into that place, that safe place or that good memory. And the more you think about it and the more details you give it, the better. Now, you can also use bilateral stimulation. You can do, and it helps a lot of people. Don't think that I'm just telling you something really ridiculous, even if it does look ridiculous. But while you're thinking about it, you can do this. As you're thinking about this good thing, Think about it, let's say that I'm thinking about this beautiful beach that I was at, and I'm imagining the color of the beach, and the water, and the smells, and the sound of the breeze, and the sound of the seagulls, and you just go like this, you are also giving yourself bilateral stimulation. And, uh, you know, this is another way of sort of strengthening that resource for yourself. And if you are, let's say, about to go to something, I don't know, an interaction with someone you don't, uh, you don't know how to handle it, or you think it might be difficult, or you just have a low moment, you can go back to that place in your head and try to do that. For some people, it won't work. For many people, it does work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.